Thanks for watching. This is another video on Elizabeth Holmes. I want to do a special video because I have a new camera, I have a new microphone. I hope everything looks good. So this one is going to be between Elizabeth Holmes and George Shores. So George Shores, he already passed away. He died in February 2021. So a little bit of background on him. So first of all, he was a member of the board of directors of Theranos from 2011 to 2015. So he basically dropped out of the board when the Wall Street Journal article came out. And a little bit more on his past. So he has a PhD in economics from MIT and he served under four presidents. He was the Secretary of State for seven years and he fought in World War II. So this is someone who by no means is an idiot. This is someone who is extremely accomplished, extremely high level and still wasn't really able to assess the personality or the level of fraud that Elizabeth Holmes brought to the table. I'm not going to talk too long this time. I'm going to go straight into the interview. So first of all, the interview is from 2015 from Stanford. So this is a very, I want to say, an extremely unwatched and extremely boring conversation between the two of them. I'm trying to make it interesting. I'm just going to look at the interesting bit. The conversation is pretty long. It's over 40 minutes. And they're basically just talking about everything. But everything is even more dumbed down than it usually is because George Shaw's wants her to really dumb it down as much as possible. So they're not really technical. And I believe in the end, they even have some audience questions, which is kind of interesting. Let's get right into the interview. But let me first introduce her. Where are you? There she is. When John brought her over about three years ago, I looked at her and I said, well, we're about to have a meeting with a friend of my granddaughter. <laughs> as soon as she started talking, I did a double take. I do want to stop so early on, but first of all, everybody does a double take as soon as she starts speaking. It's so funny that this is the introduction. As soon as he heard her, he did a double take. And it also kind of makes sense because if you think about it now, we know Elizabeth Holmes as a 37 year old. So we're thinking, why would you fake your voice? It doesn't make any sense. Why would you fake your voice if you're, let's say, a woman who's over 30 and clearly seems very professional in her demeanor, but she started out as an 18, 19 year old dropout. So she she had to face that she was the friend of the niece, you know, like the friend of the daughter or whatever. So she was always the little girl compared to the people she talked to. I think Tim Draper, the other video I did was one of the first ones. He obviously as well, he helped out a lot. This is all a family environment. So she was the little girl. It makes much more sense for her to change her voice based on that because she was young and she had all these older men around her than to do it now. Now it seems completely ridiculous. It seems like this completely escalated, but it makes Makes sense as a teenager but unfortunately she didn't really find the right moment to stop she probably would have liked to just do it from like 18 and then she slowly stopped in her mid-20s and everything is good but she just kept doing it she would be less ridiculous if she just stopped let's say in her mid-20s and then we had a normal voice Elizabeth Holmes but now we have the full package we have the weird voice the weird eyes everything I subsequently learned that as a teenager she went to China Learned Mandarin, got a degree from Peking University, got a job in Singapore. Help. Has anybody heard her speak Mandarin? I would be really interested. Actually, I'm going to look that up. I would be really interested. How deep is her voice in Mandarin? Helping with this arts program. Came to Stanford. As a freshman and sophomore, she's taking advanced courses in chemical engineering and electrical engineering. She's a dropout. I've got to first say what a what a privilege it is for for me to be here with all of you and and sitting up here with with George. It's been one of the great honors of my life to be able to have him be part of our work and and to learn from him. Well, let's think about preventive one of the things I'm noticing about her is how uncomfortable she is. I already said it before. Now she's actually half leaning back. I think she's still figuring out how she wants to sit because she knows it's going to be a long interview. But what you see is even now she's like clenching her fist. You never really see her really lean back. If it's a one hour video, you would expect that someone gets a little bit comfortable. But even during the video, she never really gets comfortable. Look at how she looks now. Clenching her fist, even her mouth looks very uncomfortable. It's almost like she has a very tense jaw. So you never really see her be comfortable and he he is not just old he has all of the behaviors you would expect from a really really old person he seems like someone who is not fully there anymore i'm not saying this in a mean way there's a lot of old people who are fully there
there. He seems like he doesn't register everything in the same way he probably would have, let's say, 20 or 30 years ago. I'm actually not surprised that he didn't catch, let's say, character flaws. I bet if he had met Elizabeth Holmes when he was 30 years younger, I think he probably would have been far less interested or he would have seen more red flags because clearly he must have been a very smart guy. Let's go on. How important it is. Instead of treating an illness, you see it coming and you prevent it. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, they say. Actually, in this case, it's worth about a ton of cure. In the first place, the more you do preventive medicine, the better the quality of life of people are. This is the point in the video where you realize how boring it is <laughs> because he's talking so slowly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the interesting bits because I know she is more interesting than him. So let's skip to the part where she is talking about preventive medicine because this is everything Theranos was about. They measure and then they're able to prevent a disease before it occurs. This is the whole vision she put out. Pay very good attention to a hand movement because she is going to do this. She's conducting what she's going to say. I don't know why she's doing it, but this is the first time I notice it this clearly. We, we strongly believe that perhaps one of the greatest challenges in our current healthcare system is that the system is built around a paradigm of what's defined as quote unquote medical necessity. So this concept that for something to be paid for by insurance, and therefore to be quote unquote justifiable as an expense, you have to be symptomatic for a given condition. So for example, means sick. sick. Yeah. He's dumbing it down so much. Even now she says symptomatic and this is not dumb enough. We have to make it even dumber. And then he says, you mean sick. So you can see that he is as untechnical a person as you can be. And I always feel so bad when you're convincing people who you know have a vested interest in this working. So they have a vested interest in suspending their disbelief. He probably struggles with some type of illness. I know in the EU, it's like crazy statistic where you have everybody above 65 has, I think, five comorbidities or something, meaning that whatever, they're obese, they have diabetes, they have whatever, cancer, blah, blah. So all of these things. So when he is talking about preventive medicine, and he made the analogy saying that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And he says, whatever, this is a thousand pounds. You can see that he probably has a very vested interest in that. I don't know his medical history. I don't know anything about that. This is not public and he's already died. But the point being is that it's kind of sad because you can definitely see that he should have known better, but you can also see that he is at the end of his life and he is just seeing this interesting med tech application. He probably has struggled with a lot of health things. So that's a little bit sad. But did you notice her hand? She She's like doing this all the time. In one of my previous videos, I said that she's talking very slowly. And the intention behind that is to really focus everything on her answer. And it makes the answer more valuable. And even if they do catch on, they might think, oh, maybe I am misunderstanding her genius. And I think this is what happened a lot. So obviously, a lot of people called her out. Pfizer basically discovered her very early on during the due diligence. They realized, okay, she doesn't really have the technology. She doesn't really know what she's doing. But a lot of people, I bet, listened to her. They weren't technical experts, but maybe they have a bachelor's in biology or whatever. And they thought, hmm, what she just said doesn't really make that much sense. It's a weird answer, but maybe I'm not understanding the genius of what she's doing. I think a lot of people were caught off guard by that. But what she's doing now, the hand movement, I think this is the cleanest example of showing how she's conducting her answers. Because I said it before, she's talking so slowly and she's always stringing these big buzzwords together. But here you can see how she really is constructing an answer and she's doing it in such a slow way that it really attracts all of the attention of the people listening to her she's like mm -hmm. yeah so if you go I like short words yeah good <laughs> if you go to a doctor and uh, you're walking in effectively with chest pains that doctor will order tests for heart disease but if you're going in notice that She's starting out in a social tone where she's kind of smiling and laughing. And it's almost like she's self-hypnotizing because she is then 
falling back into this shtick where she's talking like that. And by the way, I probably shouldn't say this. If there was a defense that she has been controlled, then she should make an argument that she has been hypnotized because on all her speeches and every time she talks, she's kind of doing that thing. It's almost like she's reading a teleprompter that doesn't exist, almost like it's subconscious. So if there was a defense, then you have been hypnotized by someone and this is why you do that. But look at the hands. She keeps doing that. She's self-conducting what she's saying. It's the invisible teleprompter. I'm saying I'm worried worried about a family hereditary risk of heart disease, the doctor cannot order those tests for risk of heart disease if you want those tests to be paid for by insurance, which means those tests don't get ordered until you're often symptomatic because the cost of doing this type of testing is so high that an individual most often does not have the ability to afford it on an out-of-pocket basis because there is no transparency around pricing and market forces. It doesn't matter what she says at this point. Nobody is really listening to what she's saying. Everybody is just in this vibe because she's creating a rhythm. She's literally creating a rhythm with her hands and she's pulling people into that rhythm. It doesn't matter what she says. Right now, all you're listening to the familiar voice, you're listening to this hypnotic voice. She's moving her hands like that. Absolutely doesn't matter what she's saying at this point. And what is also really funny is her confused look. It looks like A, she has practiced this into oblivion so she is so in her practice that she actually is conducting herself in the same way you would conduct an orchestra that has practiced for weeks or months or years so she's kind of doing that but on the other side she also looks a little confused as if this is the first time she hears it so she kind of does well she looks like this is the first time she's actually saying it but she also seems like she has said this a million times before the mirror and if you want to spin this further, this could obviously be the way she's sitting, but if you want to spin this further, right hand, left brain, so it's kind of like the logical side. I hope I get this right. This should be the connection. So the logical speech side of the brain. Let's keep watching. This have not really been able to take play in the context of driving down cost in this space to date. So if we can better engage the individual and apply technology toward empowering individuals to play a role in, for example, the access to health information, by definition, the more... Have you guys seen that show Westworld? There's this one part, and I don't want to spoil it, but in Westworld, there's this one part where one of the robots is basically in this maintenance part, but it's aware. And she's opening the tablet where she has like these speech patterns. And she wants to talk as she's reading how her speech is being computed. And she sees the word she's just coming up with being generated in the platform, then everything has an error. She's kind of doing the same thing. She's generating the words almost like a robot. Actually, it's exactly like in Westworld. We get the individual involved in the process, the more there's going to be an understanding of prices. And you as gave me, the other day when we were talking, you gave me a little incident of something that happened in Arizona. Yeah. Where our system is deployed pretty fully. Why don't you just, for a concrete example. I just have to pause. She's still loaded. He talked to her, but she just put down a hand. But the hand, look at her hand. The hand is ready to keep going. She's still in that stick. I would like an expert in psychology and an expert in hypnosis to look at her because this would be really interesting to me. It looks like she's still loaded, ready to go. So I think she's waiting for him to stop and then she could go on or if she realizes she's probably going to change her posture if she realizes that she doesn't have to continue this. But in her stream of thought, she's still in this moment where she wants to keep going. What happened to prices? Sure. I mean, we... we um... Now she threw it away. She literally did the hand motion. Sure. I mean, we now she's completely out of it. Now she does something else. We we, um, we offer our tests at at fifty to ninety percent off of Medicare's reimbursement rates, and so by definition, you know that means a cholesterol test is two dollars. That's something that people can afford. And what's happening there is because all of our prices are posted and transparent, 
Okay, I'm now actually less interested in just hearing her speak. I'm more interested in analyzing what she's kind of doing. Because in the beginning, she kind of threw it away. Okay, now I'm talking about something else. And then she was very relaxed when she was specific. She had a very relaxed body language. And then the more she got to the point where she didn't really have an answer and she had to be vague, then she becomes very tense and very firm. Just now you saw her being a little more relaxed. Said, sure. And then she just keeps talking. But now she's slowly going back and being very tense. But just now for a moment, she was like a little bit relaxed. And now she's getting back into this, being like this, and then using her hands. Uh, physicians will look at that and then call other laboratories and say, if you don't drop your prices to these rates, I'm not going to give you my business. She's actually still really relaxed now. And so other companies are beginning to drop their prices. And she's that means even. people who don't have insurance or who have incredibly high deductibles can begin to afford the ability to get these tests in time for them to be meaningful, i.e. before you're sick. Yep. So the market works, but for the market work, you have not, people have to be able to see the prices and there has to be a competitive situation. And we have to shift from the concept that for a medical process to be quote unquote justifiable or something that's paid for by insurance, you have to be sick to a paradigm in which you're able to get access to those services in a preventative context. And the only way to do that is to transform the pricing model where you drop the cost of these services. Because right now, the per service or per product cost is so high that we've built this system around these concepts of quote unquote justifiable expenses. She always looks so tense when she stops talking. A conversation is when you kind of have a good rapport with another person. So you kind of look into someone's eyes and you adjust what you want to say as you speak to them. But she kind of never does that. She has a space where she is explaining something. This is what we know. She's also a little bit tense there, but this is where she's, I think, the most confident. And as soon as she stops speaking, she always looks very tense. I mean, now look at her face. Let me skip back a little bit. Full expenses. Let me uh... immediately look down. This is so weird if you think about it. People look down if the other person is not looking at them. We don't know what he's doing. So if he were to not look at her at all, then she had all the reason to look down. But now it's kind of weird because she's over looking down. She's looking at her own legs instead of just looking at the audience or whatever. Every time she stops talking, she kind of looks very tense. She doesn't really have a really good listening face and listening eye contact. I think she has very, very strong speaking eye contact is when you're speaking, when you're like flowing because you're talking, she's really good at that. I mean, good just by having eye contact. But as soon as she's the listening part, I think it's very difficult for her. You see her listen a lot when she's kind of like leaning forward and then she's nodding a lot. But to just be friendly and listening, I think she has some real trouble with that. And even now, I don't know what this means. I think she's just so uncomfortable in these situations. If she writes a memoir, I'm going to buy it for sure. I want to read that because I would like to know, let's say in 20 or 30 years, I would like to know what she has gone through, what she has been thinking, what has been her perspective. I would be really interested in that because this is the one thing we have never heard. We have never really heard her say anything private outside of text messages. If you look at the whole, whatever it is, 600 pages of text, this would be probably interesting, but we clearly don't know anything about what's going on in her brain. Is she struggling? Is she comfortable? Is she saying that I love these interviews? Is she like sweating when she comes out? It's really hard to say. Pushing a little different direction. If She's like looking down. Did you see that? She didn't even nod really. He said, let's go into a different direction. And she doesn't properly nod. She's like almost too tense to nod. She looks like a girl that has just been scolded. And now her father is basically still scolding her and saying, okay, now we have to go. And she's just nodding. She looks like she has done something wrong. I mean, look at her nod when he's saying, let's change the subject. Push in a little different direction. <laughs> If costs are low and the trauma of a test. <laughs> she's, she's probably thinking, what am I doing here? Her mind is like spinning and he's talking super slow. And she probably can already predict what she's going to say because his questions aren't that great. You would think that she would be the most comfortable with him. 
because clearly he is the least discerning of the people she's with. Even Tim Draper, who probably didn't really do much of a due diligence, I mean, clearly didn't. Even he must have asked really difficult questions that she really had to bring out her deepest voice to answer. But in this particular case, I'm a little confused because he should be the easiest interviewer she had ever had because he doesn't get the technology and clearly he doesn't really fully see her at this point because already quite old still she's ultra tense is reduced there's a wonderful picture on the wall uh, i've got a copy of it hanging on my conference room wall this is the level of the conversation let's skip forward yeah we, we've seen it we've seen it in arizona and you know it's the published numbers are 40 to 60 percent We've seen it in you know the high fifty something percentage, and um, and what's happening there is is this concept of access. So today in our country, even when people are walking in with a symptom for a given disease, they're not following through with actually getting these tests done that are ordered for them by physicians. And so you look at that and you say, well, why is that? Well. They can't afford it, and that that is one of the big problems. Um, it's not accessible in the context of the convenience of being able to get, for example, these services done without having to leave work or um, you know take time off during the day, um, or they're they're scared of needles and and these types of impediments. Do you see how relaxed she is? She gets really tense if she has to explain the technology and how it works. Then she becomes very unemotional and very much like a robot, like Westworld. Predictive language, access, technology, but. But now she's very relaxed because she's talking about something that a kid could understand, meaning that this is very easy to argue. She says, people can't take needles. Needles are bad. Thus, you have something that works without a needle or is it just a finger prick, whatever it is. Now she's really relaxed. She's almost smiling a little bit. You can see her body language. Let's go into to some more technical things. We have begun to look at this in the context of individual engagement because 20%, for example, of our healthcare spend is associated with type 2 diabetes, which is a disease that is completely reversible if an individual is informed and makes decisions to change lifestyle and diet and exercise. This is actually a horrible example because if you think of point of care, you think of diabetes because you know glucose tests are everywhere. You can just buy one, you can test your own glucose, you can do it in a pharmacy, you can ask a doctor just needs like these finger pricks and can measure that for you. It's so easy. You don't need a laboratory for that. It's kind of funny that she's in an environment where nobody even calls out on that. Everybody who has ever been at a doctor's office knows how easy a glucose test Everybody who knows someone with diabetes, which statistically speaking, everybody knows someone, knows that glucose tests are everywhere. So it's kind of funny that nobody's calling her out on that. But even George Scholes, I would expect, should know how available these tests are, but even he doesn't call her out. ...and related things. And if we can give people access to this data, if we can get them more engaged, we can begin to see that ownership and personal accountability which will help to facilitate changes in so many of these diseases because right now, you know, there's 80 million pre-diabetics in this country who don't know that they have uh, diabetes. A lot of this comes from analyzing what's going on in blood. <clears throat> so let me ask you a kind of technical question. What is there about blood that contains things that you can see that are analytically powerful. It all just looks like red and it runs as far as I'm concerned. Okay, if you didn't believe that he wasn't a technical person, now you should know. He just asked what is good about blood. So, you know what, let's hear our answer first and then I'm going to speak. Um, the People talk a lot about <clears throat> personalized medicine in the context of the genome and the power of blood is that you're looking not just at your genetic composition, but also how that genetic composition is expressed over time. So you may have a gene, for example, but it may not be turned on. And Okay, so here's the thing. I'm a chemist, not a biologist. 
I've done a little bit of research on some project that I've been working on, the word biology, biochemistry, whatever. So I know enough that what she's now talking about is epigenetics or epigenomics. So what she's basically talking about is gene expression data, meaning that if you have a gene, what matters is, is it going to be activated or not activated? Is it going to be on or off? Is it going to be expressed? So this is what she's talking about. But remember, the question was, why is blood good for measurements? And this is not the answer you would give, because clearly epigenomics is a very interesting field. But why is this the first answer you give? Because blood contains minerals, enzymes, proteins, DNA, white blood cells, a lot of stuff that you just measure in a standard way, because it contains a lot of things, a lot of biomarkers you can measure from minerals minerals to proteins to whatever this is why in her case if she was an expert she would have said well if you look at all the options we have we can measure locally but the benefit obviously of blood is it contains a lot of things a lot of the things that happen in the body are going to be circulated in some way there are quite a lot of things that you can measure in the blood you wouldn't expect and on the other side just the amount of nutrients and biomarkers and data you can get from blood this is the answer why blood because it's so rich in things you can measure so many many things that you can measure and then draw conclusions but what she's saying she is skipping this essential part which he didn't get she's completely skipping that and she's talking about epigenomics which is interesting but if you go to the doctor and you ask him why do we measure blood at all they're not going to talk about epigenomics they're going to talk about all the things that are in blood that i probably don't know about but she's not even mentioning that what you're interested in is how does it turn on and how does it express itself based on the environmental factors that you're exposed to. No, but what is it that you see in blood that enables you to identify those things? This is completely underrated because he asked her a very simple question, which she could have answered pretty easily, but now she went into epigenetics, epigenomics. It was clearly a dumb answer. It's really funny because now he's cornering her and he doesn't even realize that this is what he's doing. And also another addition to that, if you say that the main reason why you measure blood is epigenetics and this is what you do, she is a blood measuring company. This is what she does. Does that mean that everything she does is epigenetics? How does that relate to the whole innovation? Because if now she's talking about epigenetics this is a field that's largely unexplored to know what actually turns genes on turns them off and knowing that is one thing but then influencing that is a completely different thing she's talking almost about a completely different project completely different type of company completely different type of research she had talked about miniaturizing sample measurements and now she's talking about epigenetics i'm actually surprised that this didn't get more coverage or that she wasn't called out more on that i've never heard her talk about this again it's kind of the only thing i don't know maybe this was an accident maybe she just read some article and she just wanted to put it out but yeah let's yeah, keep going Genes, markers what are markers enzymes yeah uh, we we look heavily at at the different combinations of proteins enzymes cells dna that allow you to characterize the expression of your genome and then the onset of disease effectively over time. So tell me if Okay, she said it. DNA, enzymes, I mean minerals, obviously. I'm saying this right. So you learn about certain patterns that are seen in blood that tell you about a potential disease. And when you see that, you say to somebody, here you are. Now, you told me one time that there is a doctor at Johns Hopkins who has figured out how to spot pancreatic cancer 17 years before it's symptomatic. That's breathtaking. But it's on the basis of seeing these markers that you're talking about. And if you have that, if you have panc pancreatic cancer and you know it, it's too late. Okay, let's skip him. I'm sorry, but he's just talking about disease. You can see his incentive of talking about these things. He probably had some diseases for sure. He probably has a lot of comorbidities. He's obese. He has a very vested interest in that. He's probably also thinking about his children, whatever. Uh, absolutely. I mean, the, the first step... Can I tell Mohammed that uh, you approve? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, don't... I don't know who Mohammed is in this context. The first step in in actually shifting to a model where we're focused on regression of disease. She's getting serious. Now she's doing both hands. Is, is understanding and knowledge. And with that understanding and knowledge comes engagement. But I mean, for example, until last year, 
it was illegal in most states in this country for people to get copies of lab results that were ordered for them by their physicians. So how you're going to get someone to reverse their diabetes or their heart disease becomes quite complicated if you're saying it's illegal for them to even access the information that will help them to understand their condition. In the same way, today, in many states, it's... I just want to say she's completely ruining my theory because now she's using the other hand. But then again, she's relaxed. She isn't raised her eyebrow. She was kind of speaking and then she kind of raised it up. In the <laughs> Do you see that? She's like the whole wave going on. In the same way, today... But she's much more relaxed now. In many states, it's illegal for individuals to have the ability to order a test. And she's much more relaxed because she can guilt people into some emotion. She's guilting them into feeling bad about the current state, about bad about, okay, this is all horrible. It's forbidden that they get their own health data. We want to free people. She's like the Robin Hood of testing. You know, she gives them the data. She enables them. She's democratizing and everybody's getting that. As soon as she's there, she's very relaxed. Now she kind of got the tough question out of the way about why do you measure blood? Very difficult question. Now she's much more relaxed. Let's go to the audience questions because lucky for us she actually gets some audience questions and this is stanford so let's hope she gets some really tough ones everybody's stunned with no questions there's one over here somebody got a mic so i have a question on the uh on the continuum of all the things all the diseases and everything that kills people what percent of those do you think you can find by blood testing it's a great question. I mean, we, from what we've seen, every condition manifests in the blood, right? This can't be true. There have to be diseases that you can't find in the blood. I know that a lot of things have to be transported or you find some artifacts of some disease in the blood. You find some biomarkers, some byproducts, some waste. So something you can probably find, but every disease manifests in the blood. My intuition would be that it is completely false. If you're an expert, leave a comment. But this seems kind of ridiculous. There have to be a lot of diseases that you just can't find in the blood because they just never get there or whatever. So... It's a question of understanding how to characterize that. And that's what some of this work in studying the onset of these diseases is about. Because today, the whole paradigm has been to look at, you know, once you have a, system, a symptom, what, what are the markers in your blood? But those are not very useful markers, right? I mean, we really need to be understanding what the onset Okay, so what she's saying is once you have a symptom, it's already too late. Obviously, this is the whole point. And I'm not saying this is the wrong approach. If you can predict or really preempt the disease, this is the holy grail. This is exactly what you want. But she is now saying that clearly she is saying that she wants to find different biomarkers because the ones we have are not good enough, which is not the same thing as to say we want to condense a laboratory into a small scale. Now she's saying they want to have completely different biomarkers. So this is not about validating existing biomarkers. She also wants to discover new ones. She really needs a lineup of medical chemists and scientists and doctors to just keep hammering her with questions she should have been grilled for a long time and actually here's something because pfizer did a due diligence on the company right and they concluded that she didn't really have the technology they looked at the pushback they got from her and okay she didn't answer the questions we think she is deceptive her personality seems deceptive they don't seem to have the technology this was pfizer this was a long time ago. So what I think should be a law, I mean, obviously this could also be a really bad idea, but in my mind, it makes sense. The law should be if you have found a company to highly likely be fraudulent after you have done a formal due diligence, then it would be negligent of you not to inform the authorities. So for example, if I do due diligence because I might have a, a partnering relationship, maybe I'm going to become a customer, maybe they're going to become a customer, whatever. If I do due diligence in that company and I figure out as my assessment that I believe that this company is likely fraudulent, then it is my responsibility to report it to the authorities. I think this kind of makes sense. It's kind of almost like snitching on a company level, but in a way that is supposed to protect investors. And obviously, if it's a medical technology, this is going to protect the consumers as well. This is just me brainstorming. Maybe this exists. I don't know. But if Pfizer had put this to the SEC then, and if they had pushed that, then I think this would have never happened. Instead of disease looks like um, it's, I'm sure you've read in, in papers people are looking at everything from the manifestation of Alzheimer's which is a neurological condition 
all the way through to all sorts of different cancers in blood, right? Because ultimately, in the, the body's connected. So physiologically, you will see the effect of these different conditions in blood. The, the, the question becomes, what do you measure? And, and that's something that, that we're spending a lot of time on by trying to leverage some of these changes that I spoke about on access to make it possible. What I find funny is she often gives answers that are kind of bad, even though she could have given a good answer. If he asks, okay, how many of the diseases are actually measurable in the blood? Then she could have just said, okay, what are the biggest ones? We're looking at cancer. We're looking at heart disease. We're looking at diabetes. These are making up, let's say, so and so much of the medical costs. They are very much noticeable in the blood. And then she could have said, of course, there are also some exceptions that we're not going to look at. And maybe named a few there. But the fact that she hasn't really prepared a very fundamental answer answer like that yeah i mean obviously we all know what happens we all know that how crazy this all is but she's basically a red flag i don't know why she's wearing black she's a complete red flag just by this answer but we all know this she has been a red flag from the beginning but it's funny to look at that now possible to get higher integrity measurements to to characterize that she looks very relaxed uh, thank you Elizabeth. smiling a uh, quick question about on the regulatory side uh, i think that uh Sometimes the FDA has been slow on approving biomarkers in the diagnostic space. Could you comment kindly? Thank you so much. Approval of biomarkers is funny because they at some point had one biomarker that they wanted to get approved in 2016. But she's the worst person to ask about that. She doesn't even have the research ready to approve anything. And then knowing about the whole process, she's probably going to talk about how difficult it is. And this is a challenge they're facing, I'm guessing. Sure. Uh, this, this is a very important area. And George was asking about the work we're doing in Arizona and our work and our belief that fundamentally an informed patient is a better patient and that this reality that individuals can't get tests. Stop. She's not answering the question at all. Very specifically, the question was, what is the process of the FDA approval? Because it's very difficult to get these new biomarkers approved. And she insinuated that they're looking for new biomarkers as opposed to existing ones and then providing a new way of measuring them, having to validate that new method. But she's saying, oh, we kind of want to find new biomarkers too. Very specific question. She's not even bothering to answer it. Ordered by physicians unless their symptomatic so that they can be paid for needs to shift in such a way in which the individual has better access to the tests and we can drive prices down which will give them better access to tests and therefore more direct engagement well if we're going to do that those tests better be at the highest levels of quality and so our company actually just recently filed a public comment um, in support of FDA regulation of all laboratory tests, we're the first and only lab to do that because we strongly believe that the regulatory bar that is set by FDA uh, is the right bar for determining the integrity of these tests. And having gone through the certified laboratory process, if you do not meet that bar, fundamentally, you do not have the same integrity of testing uh, that, uh, that you otherwise would. Um, so it is, it is an extremely um, time-intensive process, and it is uh, expensive. Uh, but if we don't realize those standards, then we can't enable individuals to get more engaged in the testing process. And we think that's a critical thing. So her answers are very nonsensical. I know someone actually commented on one of the videos saying, oh, her answer makes sense. Of course, it makes sense. She's using grammar correctly. She's actually speaking normal English, so it makes sense. And what she's saying also makes sense. It's just the connection doesn't make sense. So it makes sense to say that, yes, there should be a very high bar to protect consumers. And it's yes, it's very important that there's a really rigorous standard. And they are basically being strong supporters of regulations to make sure that everything is correct 
them. She said it's very expensive and blah. But then she's connecting that to talk about getting the tests in the hand of the consumers, which is a weird step if you think about it. The question is, what is the difficulty of getting these biomarkers approved? Every normal CEO or entrepreneur, I mean, there are a lot of non-technical CEOs. So let's say every technical lead of these companies would usually go into that. Okay, yeah, we have these biomarkers. We have made this experience. So the way this would usually work, the challenges we see, how we mitigate the challenges. So we'll kind of go into that. What she really is doing is she's stringing together completely unrelated things. She's giving a bad answer, which is not really answering the question of how do you get these new biomarkers approved. And then she's connecting that to something that she knows is going to hit the audience, which is, again, guilting them into thinking that they are enabling, they're democratizing, they're giving the tests to all the people who wouldn't have Medicare, they wouldn't have healthcare. She is always doing this thing. Yes, it makes sense what she is saying, but it's super weird the way she's saying it. She's connecting unconnected things. She's not answering the question. She's always like weirdly trying to get back into her stick. It's tough. I just uh, maybe like to ask a little bit about what you're doing. Uh, is a big structure going up on Page Mill Road. You're hiring people. You're making decisions about who to bring in and, and, and what to do, putting together a team. I mean, it's really what it's all about. Yeah. Maybe you could say a little bit about that. Yeah, um, we, we, have, we have the great privilege of pursuing the incredible legacy that exists here in Silicon Valley of um, building something to try to make a difference in the world and to bring together a group of people who are at a point in time in their life in which they want to do the best work of their life and they want to do something that they can look back on for the rest of their lives and know that they're going to change the world. And um, a lot of those come from Stanford and uh, a lot of them don't. And um, and we we have um, we have the opportunity to build a company that we've tried to design to be very very long term in our thinking and decision making and investments i think this is the perfect ending i have a feeling that this video might have been way too boring if this is boring let me know and this is the last holmes video but here's the thing i in my previous video said that i think she would have been a good politician i'm actually changing my mind now because if you look at her like hunched over like that she looks more like Gollum than she would like let's say bill clinton or some of the professional politicians you know even whatever obama these people who you know who are basically have been politicians the whole life or they've basically been politicians most of their professional life they usually have very good eye contact they're very calm they're not that weird if you go to a high level you're really good at either not being weird at all or hiding your weirdness so right? trying not to really seep it out making sure that it never really shows but she really is just weird i think her eye contact is bad you don't really see her on a public event where she's like talking to people shaking hands going to that I think when it comes to like a networking event, I think she would be really bad. I think her at a networking event would, I think, be really, really bad. And you can say what you want about politicians. A good communicator has to be a good listener. And I don't think she's a good listener. I think she's good at pushing through her agenda. And clearly she's not good at protecting herself in the long term. I think politicians are generally really good at controlling public perception in a way in which even if they do something that's completely horrible, they will never face the consequences for that. And yet she faced the consequence because she didn't think. She didn't think long term. This is now my new opinion. I think she would have actually been a horrible politician. And I don't really know what she would have been good at. She would have maybe been good as a chief marketing officer or just whatever chief operating officer someone who is not the lead neither tech nor the ceo but then her whole voice and thing wouldn't have fit her whole voice and everything fits because she is like this misunderstood weird genius but if she is the ceo or she's like the second or third in command then i think her voice would have been just weird and nobody would have seen her as a genius or whatever her whole demeanor only fits if she was a technical genius if she had a different position i think she would have 
been horrible at raising financing and all of that stuff. So I honestly now think that there would have been nothing that she would have excelled at outside of this, whatever this is. Is it a fraud? Is it a scam? Crime? Is it just incompetence? Whatever the court are going to rule and whatever it is, I think this is the only thing she would have been good at. All right, new camera, new microphone. I hope the quality is better. Let me know.